As lovers of all things tartan, we are always very excited when we find other people who share our passion. And so tonight on Another Thing About Tartan, I'm so pleased to welcome Scott Meacham Wood to tell us about his connection to Scotland and where his love for tartan first started. Oh. Hi! How are you today? I'm good. Greetings from Manhattan. <laughs> where it's slightly warmer but slightly earlier than it is i'm sure there in scotland <laughs> yeah it's pretty cold today it's actually been raining for most of the day so typical scotland <laughs> so scott we know that you're super passionate about tartan and scottish culture but can you tell us about your connection to scotland it's actually a family on my mom um, they were originally from, from Aberdeen up on the Northeast coast. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, my grandmother is amazing Scottish bro that I remember so dearly. Um, and then my grandmother who was from the American South, she's from Alabama. So they were, that's kind of the mixture of who I am. Are those two, are those two, um, kind of ancestors. Um, yeah. And I've, I, you know, so I don't know about Scotland in the abstract because I didn't, you know, I we had no connection to it. I mean, other than just my family connection. Mm -hmm. When I first started traveling there and started studying Scottish history and learning more about the culture, like I find it, I find it very fascinating. Yeah. Um, and romantic. And my, my father um, was ex-military. So I love all the kind of the military connections that Scotland has and those, and the amazing uniforms and, um, it's just, it's just a really fascinating culture. And I did honestly like burst into tears the first time that I got to Edinburgh. Um, Cause it was just such a, it's just, it's almost like a movie set. It's so kind of magical. I tell people, um, friends of mine here in the States who are going to Scotland. I'm like, you know, what do we, what do we need to go see? What are, and like, the beautiful thing about Scotland is that like all of Scotland is Scotland. You can yeah. close your eyes, you can close your eyes been around with the camera and take pictures and it and they'll be beautiful like there's so much so the countryside is beautiful little tiny little towns by the side of the road are charming um i mean Edinburgh, just, just i love that for those of you that and kind of cut in half by the train station and there's a kind of new town and old towns from the 1300s if yeah, i recall I'm correctly. Sure, yeah maybe like that yeah the new shiny part of town that they just built was from the 1700s. <laughs> I know it's crazy, um, yeah. but that's the new town, isn't it? It is. It is. It's just, and and everyone is so kind. There are usually, if I'm in town for you know three or four days, the first day, I'm like, oh my god, what have I said yes to? Like I can't, like I, I'm like my ear needs to kind of like click into the accent. It takes about 24 hours, and then I'm yeah. fine. Yes. I love it, yeah. I think sometimes we can take it for granted because we're so used to living in Scotland and then when someone like yourself is so enthusiastic about it, it makes me feel so much more grateful to be able to live in such a beautiful country. Um, I'm feeling the same way about New York. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's like both of them are very magical places to live. Yeah, de definitely, I would agree. So, although you have Scottish roots, you grew up in the southern state of Mississippi. Do you feel that growing up there has influenced your design style? It has, and actually there's a slightly more complicated version of that story. Okay. Uh, they get it to write down. Um, so my, like I said, my father was ex, um, was American military. Uh -huh. So the first 10 years of my life, I grew up a little internationally. I was born in Southern Canada. We lived in Miami. Um, in Southern Florida, I lived in South Korea and in Japan. Then we moved to Los Angeles as my father was stationed around the world. But he was originally from a small town in Mississippi. So that's kind of how we retired when I was in the fifth grade. Right. Um, and then we moved back to, like, to the land that his family had owned since like the 1800s, something ridiculous like that. Um, so. I had this very international upbringing, then I had this very like small town rural Mississippi upbringing as well. Mm -hmm. um, the great thing about the South, and this does influence my design, Southern homes are 
open. You just can go by and the door and watch. Like they're all about about the hospitality of bringing people into your home. Mm-hmm. And, and the design that's fantastic because that means I I have a real hopefully a real honest connection to how houses can and should be used. So mm-hmm. it's all about all about the hospitality of uh, inviting people into your home. Yeah. Yeah definitely. Yeah I can I can understand how that could have an effect on, on your design, yeah. So I mean, we- like if we left if we left the house like my I would work going into town to do something. She would always fluff the pillow, uh, 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 the cushions on the sofa. She's like, "What if somebody comes home with us?" So like we leave the house ready to bring guests back. <laughs> yes, yeah, she was like always expecting it. Yes, yes. Oh, that's nice though. That is really nice. So we know that you first started your career at Ralph Lauren, but can you tell us how you first became interested in interior design? Um, I mean, I can still remember in high school and college getting architecture digest files and house all for and loving those what to me at the time seemed like very intimate glimpses into people's homes. Mm-hmm. Um, now that they're very they're very crafted and none of that just happens by accident um but i uh, i think the way people live is really fascinating i think the way that people use their houses is really fascinating um i had always wanted to work for Ralph. like my my biggest fear when i finally got hired was that i was going to work in it and i wasn't going to like it and they're mm-hmm. like what what the hell do i do but it's been my dream for my entire adult life with yeah. So I worked on their um, their sales floor for, I don't know, three or four years, maybe two or three, I don't remember. Um, but then there's a division of the company called Creative Services and Creative Services does um, all the windows and all the interiors and we work with the florists and the caterers. <coughs> We're kind of the, kind of like cultural managers of the store of how the store feels. So I worked for that division for about 12 years. Mm-hmm. So it was all, and the fascinating thing, this is, so the stores are built up, these kind of small little display rooms in the home collection department. And, you know, one frame, those, that one of those spaces would be this, you know, French side resort. And then we close it out a couple of days and repaint it and recarpet it and rehang on the artwork. And it's a Highland Manor. You know, six days later. So I mean, I think I learned about the kind of flexibility of interior design and how you can, like, what kind of an impact you can actually have on a on a consistent space. Mm-hmm. That was a long winded answer. I... No, definitely not. No, it's interesting to see like what what it is that fascinates you so much about interior design because I do think it is really interesting like, um, career to get into. It's fun. And, you know, and, you know, like, I'm, for projects that were deep in, and I will have picked out the china that you eat on, this, the bedding that you sleep, the, the lighting that you want, that you put yourself in the bathroom. With. It's so, in, not invasive, probably not the right word, but it's so, it's so overwhelming what all we can do for someone in their home. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I it's, just, definitely, it's definitely an, a very intimate job because yeah, people are going to be living in those homes every single day, and you and you put it together for them. So yeah, yeah it's a really important process. Yeah. And for someone who's a who's a control managing a tiny aspect of that house, where every pillow is and where every lamp is, and is it in the warehouse on the truck? Did it get delivered? Did it get packed? Did we get it in the right place? I oh my god, <laughs> I love an installed. Of watching all those little tiny disparate pieces that we've been ordering and stockpiling for, you know, sometimes a year and a half. Yeah. After the house and all the art gets, hung, all the drinks get hung, and it's just, and you know, sometimes four eight hours later we've moved out. Yeah. From a construction. Um, yeah, it's it makes me very. Happy. No, yeah, that would be it. Would definitely be so rewarding to be able to see it from the before and after and you think, wow, I did, I did that, I put that together. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, how do you feel that your career at Ralph Lauren prepared you for running your own interior design business? There are two things that I did at Ralph. Like I said, I worked in their creative department, which is which a lot of production work, like sets, we built sets. Like I could carry, I can carry anything at this point. I just yeah. need like a fulcrum and a lever to pick up anything. Um, but the other fascinating thing that we did was I worked in sales for two or three years, which was, I think, a really part of, I mean, so much of what we do in your design is selling you my idea mm -hmm. and knowing how to. Knowing how to do that, um, I you know one of one of the first things I, I first started working for the company was that if if someone came in and asked for a white large pusher and you had to run to the back to the store and get it, bring out two. Maybe they'll buy two. The basic, grab a navy one, grab a red one, maybe grab one of the new colors. So I think understanding how people like to shop for things. Mm -hmm. um, has colored I, I i show up at a first you know, the first design pitch with bags of fabric what like what because you never know what you as an individual might have you know that was that was a floral that your grandmother had in her kitchen that you hated because she was a bad cook what, whatever whatever the those kind of emotional memories that that have nothing to do with the design of the thing yeah uh, and you have no way of knowing that until we're all spread out on a table eat that fabric <laughs> um, it, that just that comes off the table and goes back in the bags. You don't have to look at. It. Yeah. Um, and you have to work on the fly. Like you know, we do so many of these meetings offside. They're really so you just had to kind of have everything with you, like three plans. If we move this fabric, then we need these other to come in. It's and I love I love I love the sound that a client makes when I get it right. Yeah. There's there's like an ooh, there's an ooh, there's a shiver, there's a quiver in their voice when we got it right. And I know that sound is one of the great sounds that I hear. Um, and so it's fun to, it's it's fun to be part of that. I think so many people invite a designer into their home when they're ready for a big change. Because mm -hmm. it is very invasive, very disruptive. Um, and it's so it's fun meeting people who are in that frame of mind, who want to create a new life for themselves. And I get to, and we get to help do that. It's fun. Yeah, no, it definitely sounds like so much fun. And um, so you've been based in San Francisco for the last 26 years, but in March 2020, you moved to New York on the other side of the country. <laughs> Can you tell us what prompted this big move and how it's affected your business? I moved across the country. Global pandemic, which was hilarious, <laughs> terrifying, and just I just got. And so my partner, um, we had had a discussion maybe six months before that. He had um, was being offered a job here in New York. I'm like, I take it, and I, you know, I probably can't move in January when you need when you need to start, but I'll trail a couple months behind you. So there was a point, even during the pandemic, when no one knew what was going on, that I didn't have a place to. Go. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't have a place to go. So it's bit like I had to move. Yeah. Because that's just what that's just what it like. So I just, you know, a kind of galloping ignorance and arrogance, got in the car, booked a truck, loaded the truck, drove to New York. And um, my partner had found the apartment that we're in now. Um, so I had only seen it photographs on like a real thing so the first time i saw our apartment um there was a 26 foot truck parked on the street they were loading stuff i was trying to do very like life and death interior design at work like on the fly triage things that came into the apartment like okay that's gonna go on that wall <laughs> every first to move by ourselves so that's where that's gonna stay <laughs> it, was a, it was it was a fun test of my career um, skills because I was like, nope, that's oh, that sofa doesn't fit through that door. We could put that sofa in this room, put that sofa in that room. I can get we can that one so we can get it through the door. Um, we have tiny why? It's a 1908 building. We have the tiniest doorways. <laughs> like I did, I had to put my, my dining table back to New, back to because we, we couldn't get it through the front door. Like 
like, 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 I'm like, let's take it back. Like, I'm, my, I'm <laughs> just tired of fighting. Oh, God. Like, and do you feel that being in a new city has inspired you? Oh, my God, yes. Even <laughs> you kind of rejected, which is what a lot of this last four years is still such a magical city. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not far from Central Park. I can go run to the park in the morning. Um, like once the museums reopen, I was we were there the first day that the Metropolitan Museum reopened because mm -hmm. I'm like, I need to go see something pretty that I've you know that's in the house. Um, no, it's, it's a very it's a vibrant city, and it's one of those places where it's getting ready to be incredibly vibrant again. Yeah. Maybe I can be part of that. I don't know. Like I don't know what I don't know what my cog in the wheel has gonna be here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just kind of braced for whatever happens. Yeah. Yeah. You're waiting for it to open to find that out. Yeah, and things are opening now. I, I there's uh, there's some new CPU requirements or recommendations that are coming out. I don't know what the, I don't know what they're gonna be. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will see. I know you guys have been. In and out of lockdown, yeah. every six weeks it feels <laughs> like. Yeah, we opened up officially yesterday. Like most businesses, like non-essential places, started to open yesterday. So that was really exciting. But there's still a long road to go. Yeah, um, yeah. It's been since we import so much from Scotland, from the UK. I I try to keep up with whatever's going on with you guys, just so I can, you know, not yell at a mill. My order when they're not open. So you're very vocal on social media about your love of tartan and even coined the phrase tartan is the new black. But what was it that first drew you to the fabric? Um again, like as a as a control group, I like that there's such limited aspects that make it a tartan. Like it is the same warp and weft pattern in both mm -hmm. directions and that's really restrictive when you think about all the all the things that you can make um and so to see a culture and um take that very teeny teeny tiny idea of how to make fabric and create hundreds of textiles just using just that tiny restrictive thing that it has to be yeah uh, i find um, I love that everything is registered and um, oh, the Tartan Authority and, and textiles getting patterns registered. I like that it has so much history um, and just the way that the Tartans developed, the way that they developed again during the era. Um, there's just, it's not like it's just a fact. It's not like it's fabric. Yeah. Like I said, I've got, I've got family connections well, thank God we have a beautiful, thank God. That was, because you don't, like it is what it is. Yeah. So I was, I'm very, um, yeah, I, I, that sound that clients make, that, I, that makes me excited, I make that sound when I see a big stack of tartan. Yeah. It, it really, I, I, I am just, someone always asks like, how do you know what it is that you are inspired by. I'm like, you, but you you always know. Mm -hmm. You always know what it is. You may not recognize it or see it for for its impact on your life. You know, you you know what makes you go ooh. Yeah. Um, whether it's an antique floral or beautiful arts and crafts furniture, which are both things both things that I also love. Yeah. No, yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. You, you like the history behind Tartan and, and the story that it holds. And... Oh, absolutely. And, and the yeah. fact that it's continuing to evolve, that there's still fresh Tartans being created, you know, today, right now, yeah. the islands, trying out, you know, making something custom for a designer or for an interior designer or for one of the fabric houses. Like, it doesn't... I like that I can pull fabrics from my own collection some of which were designed six and seven hundred years ago, and some of which I designed personally yeah. years ago. 
and that there's that much that it's that flexible and that plot. Yeah, it is so cool. Like it is so much more than just a pattern on a fabric. It is so much more than that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know that you like to take your own textile designs and weave them together with tartan to give them to give the tartan a, a slightly more modern twist. Are there any other aspects of Scottish culture you take inspiration from? Um, my, so my family were golf. Everybody except me. Um, um, and I find kind of Scottish golf really fascinating. It's, it, it's such a different sport than I think that American golf is. Um, it's, much, it's much more kind of rough and ready <laughs> and much less manicure than culture. It's very scrappy. Um, and, and I love that. Um, there's a part of, you know, there's so many parts of Scottish culture that get a little scrappy. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, one of the things that I love about um, the culture that's, that's, that's there. Uh, but again, like, you know, I, I, let me show you this. I've grabbed this. And said this. Like, that's one of our tartans. Oh, wow. I like we, that. Kind of basically Stuart Martin, but we just completely reimagined the color store. Uh -huh. uh, I love that, like, that this exists in the same world. That this exists. Yeah. Yeah, and just that, so different. And th I love that they together side by side and that we can help uh, kind of highlight all of that. Yeah, definitely. No, I love I love the yellow. It's so vibrant. It's really exciting, Torin. Um, yeah, that was one. That's the first one I designed. That's when I decided. Okay. I had, and this might be a question later on, but and if so, give it then. I always wanted to have a textile collection mm -hmm. from like fifteen years ago, and I remember going into my um, local one of my local showrooms in San Francisco, and like I want to have a collection with you guys. What do we do? What do we start? And the manager there said, very honestly, you need to be like 17,000 times more popular than you are now. <laughs> and so that was the night I started my blog um, and started writing and started like producing my own photography okay. and, you know, just experimenting with things I love. Tartan was obviously what we were going to start with. Yeah. So that's kind of where all of that came from. And we worked probably six or seven years ago. Like it, it's been a long time. I found the mill, I traveled to Scotland, I had done a road trip and all through the Highlands and all through um, these different mills that might be able to, to weave for me and found who I wanted to work with. Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of started, like there's a certain amount of just, whether it's arrogance or ignorance with me that I just like, well, I want a, tar I want a fabric line. I will have a fabric line and <laughs> twirl some money together and send it to Scotland. I did amazingly because we when we were first doing the initial launch of the collection, we were custom bolts of fabric and I had to order all the same fabrics and, and we were making pillows. And I finally, I one day in my office in San Francisco, we, we got a letter from like the Homeland Security Department from the government. Like you sent a lot of money to Scotland. It's fine but we can see you <laughs> like, Ooh, yay. I, we were doing so much business with Scotland that the American government, they, they didn't get involved. There was no problem, but it was a very fascinating, like, Oh no, we're making a fabric line yeah. and, and, and possibly money laundering. I don't know. <laughs> no, that was a fun, that was a fun email to get. Cause I, it, it made me really realize that we were doing something. Yeah. Or not, but at least it was significant. Yeah, people were noticing that you were making this, you were doing this exciting thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. So so what is what is that tartan called? Are they all like registered? They are. This is actually, the right yellow one is Meacham. Like I said, it was the first thing I designed. So mm -hmm. I, so I named it after me. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So everything, that was a really fun part of the textile collection as well, um, because I had to name everything. So I just, 
you know, pulled up my ancestry.com page and just went up through the layers of my, of my ancestors yeah. looking for great names. And, and we had really good names on both sides of my family, my mom's side and my dad's side. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course there's so many kind of like historic, the actual historic retardants, we just call them, you know, black watch is black watch. I don't need to rename that. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, that's really amazing. I love that it's named after members of your family. Like, it just makes it that even more special and personal to you. It's really nice. It's 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 a fun way to make a living. Like, it's fun yeah. creating. And I always, as I'm designing them, either the tartans or the florals or anything, I always like kind of decide like where they would be used. Yeah. Like this, like this was like um, a breakfast room. In Hampton and like you just kind of have kind of project it into um, its eventual usage and then we sell it to a designer and they do something completely different with it yeah. and that's really fascinating because it's seeing your own artistry as it is but then kind of transmogrified through someone else's art um, and it's, very, it's a very rewarding thing to do yeah no it sounds really amazing that's really cool that you got to do that and still get to do that all the time yes yeah that's really cool but are there any scottish designers or artists that you're particularly inspired by oh when i wrote his name down and now i can't find the piece of paper that it's on oh poo poo um it was the designer who redid the fife arms hotel okay named Russell Cage. Oh, I'm just okay. having a, I'm having a, a part. Um, so much of my experience of being in Scotland has been, has been being at hotels. Cause I obviously don't live there. So when I'm yeah. in Scotland, I'm at a hotel. Um, so that kind of hotel, um, taking something again, that's kind of a classic Highland hotel and then doing something incredibly modern and different where you just are in a constant state of delight. I mean, it's, it, it's what you might expect from a Scottish hotel, yeah. but then just blown out in 7,000 different directions mm -hmm. um, that you would never expect. And I think that's, um, I still I have a hotel cooking in me somewhere. I don't know who's gonna let me. Who, I don't know who's gonna pay me to, to design it, but someone needs to because I I I love I love that sense of um, again that kind of sense of hospitality that kind uh -huh. of draws an upbringing that you always that everybody who uses your space. Um, I think that's. Yeah. No, that is definitely very cool, yeah. It would be so cool if you got to design a whole, like the interiors of a hotel. I think how special that would be. I know. Let's let all the Preston out and get that out. Let's get the completely remodel the, the, the Preston field out happily. Yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. So um, going back to you said about designing tartans, and um, with your original designs, how long does it normally take you from like the initial idea to achieving the final design? Um, it can vary. Let's say that I get an idea, like we're gonna, I think we're gonna do a new collection of custom tartans for next year, for 2022. Okay. Already starting to work on that in my, in my head a little bit. Right. Um, I will submit CAD plan, which is um, just computer graphic um, versions of the tartan. Mm -hmm. the mill, it'll take them two months to make what's called a strike off, which is like small, like maybe like a one of your of your design, just so you can kind of see what it really looks like in in real space. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got to order stock, and then another maybe two months. I mean, if if there was a like a crisis and I needed to make a tartan for a project uh, we could get it done in three months yeah but you know the process and, and kind of go back and forth I would always like six months between mm -hmm. having an idea in my head about what, what I want to do to a 50 yard bolt of fabric in the workout ready yeah. to ship um, yeah six or eight months and the same is true for our fabrics Printed fabrics, um, oh. Georgia, and yeah, it's probably 
months between kind of initial artwork and getting all of that ironed out and track offs back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not it's not a particularly easy process. Yeah. Um, but it does mean that, you know, there's so much like if it doesn't work, I just throw it away. Like if it's not right. Like yeah, like we're not I'm not we're not gonna fight for the next fight. We're not gonna go back and forth for the next three months trying to fix this thing that's not working. Yeah. We'll make something else. Yeah. So I get I get a little ruthless when we're yeah. I think you need to be that way though. You don't want to waste your time on a design that you just know in your heart just isn't really going to work. Yeah. You, you always know. You always know yourself. You And you always know. Mm -hmm. thing like The thing that's like, like, ooh, beautiful. There's another thing that's like, ugh. Like, eh. Throw it away. Yeah. We always, we, what we call putting it in the drawer. Put it in the drawer with all the other things we have that didn't work. And then, you know, three years ago, I'll have a drawer full of things that never worked. And maybe we can make one of them work then. Who knows? Yeah. You can like revisit it again, like in years right. to come. Maybe you'll have the inspiration for like to take that idea further by then, you know, you just don't know, do you? And your brain never stops working on them. Those mm -hmm. things that I there's a couple things. It's a beautiful hand painted pheasant that we made for something that didn't work. I'm like one of these days that pheasant's gonna up on something. What it is, don't know what it's gonna look like. But I like put that in the drawer because we're gonna need one of these days we're gonna need a pheasant and we have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so COVID has given some people a lot more time in their homes, and we've noticed that we've sold a lot more fabrics for projects and people have been ordering curtains and throws. Have you noticed an increase in business and an interest in interiors in general over this time? It I think people certainly hear people on the East Coast. A lot of them went to like second homes, went to like a, a summer home mm -hmm. that they might use two months of the year, you know, during the high summer, they were living in full time. And that's just, I mean, the house was kind of like never built, like never designed for that. Mm -hmm. So there's been so much what like, I know just numerous designers who've ordered so many desks yeah. and desks, high yeah. need like flat spaces yeah. where people can work that mm -hmm. you kind of in, in your house all the time because you went to the office. Yeah. Um, so I think the, I'm curious to see what the kind of functionality of interior design turns into in the next 12 to 18 months because I, like, we still don't know, like, who else, who else going to go back to the office? Yeah. Um, because we've discovered that we can work from home, but that also means that you're home all the time. Um, yeah. and so there's, I mean, it's, it's, so this little beautiful wall behind me, this is where my, my library, um, I've got a, a tea towel on top of a filing cabinet balanced on a damp jar so that like, I've got a tea towel down so this slide. So you, we've, we've kind of, kind of had to MacGyver. You guys have MacGyver in Scotland? I don't think so, no. It was an old um, American television show, um, probably back in the 80s or 90s. Right. And it was high, and he would always, like, he like he could break out of prison with, like, a paper clip and a palm frond. He was always like, I have this and this. I can make a bomb. I can, like, whatever he needed to do, he could make it out of stuff that was always ready in hand. Yeah. So to drive or something is to, like, we need to just, we need to just take what's here and bit what I need. Um, so this is a very MacGyver, this is a very MacGyver, um, studio set up here. Yeah. I know, I think we've all become absolute pros at adapting, haven't we? You know, stacks of art books with your laptop on top of it or whatever you needed to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've definitely perfected the art of adapting. <laughs> so we can all work <laughs> from home and do everything per from home. Perfecting the art of adapting. That's like a New York Times piece in about a month. <laughs> That's a beautiful way of putting that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so what would be your advice to anyone looking to incorporate tartan into their homes in a more modern way? Um, just kind of like just do it. 
<laughs> it's here in the States, people associate it so much with the holidays. They feel like it's going to be a little Christmas in July to have carton in your house. Yeah. Uh, which is one of we've worked with like, colors. We actually are doing a bunch of collection of what we call summer tartan. And they're mm -hmm. a tartan that we did on like a cotton channel. So it feels very kind of bright summery, very bright colors. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't get don't get too caught up in the idea that it this big heavy woolly you know, fog on the moors kind of fabric. It can, it, it, it's, it's a much more flexible fabric. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, it breaks, yeah. um, embracing that flexibility. Um, and who doesn't love a lot of little cashmere tartan throw to throw over your legs when you're watching TV? I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, co it's cozy. Yeah. Yeah, you just have to kind of bite the bullet, don't you? Because I feel like tartan can work in literally any room. It's so classic and traditional that, you know, if you've already got a modern room, if you're putting tartan into it, it's not going to automatically make it an old-fashioned room. It's going to make it modern, isn't it? Right. Yeah, definitely. So customers are sometimes worried that tartan is a little bit too busy or it's a little bit overwhelming. So if you had a client that loved tartan, but preferred the more minimalistic design, how would you incorporate tartan into their homes in a more subtle way? We just did a big project in San Francisco. I haven't photographed it yet. It is all done in black watch, black leather, and chrome. Mm -hmm. So it's this very kind of, kind of modern, kind of hard edged, very reflective. Yeah. They would use watch to kind of soft. That. Um, so white lacquered wall, black lacquered draperies, which I think it turned out really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and it, like um, almost, but it's a, it's almost like a polished leather black with huge sectional end, and then it all black watch pillows on it. Mm -hmm. So it feels very very modern, um, but it has and and again. The client who loved, uh, who loved being in Scotland, he loved all the hotels there. And uh, we needed to give him something that felt very specific to him, but also had a great deal of, kind of Scottish influence in it as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just finding that balance, isn't it? And that balance, I mean, that's a, that, that is in fact a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. Very Highlandy, very like tartan everything, or just a couple of of it um pillows mm -hmm. or in, um, in a window treatment or you know i did the tartan ottoman it, darling in a, in a yeah. green room um so yeah it's kind of a scale back and forth until you find out where you're comfortable mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's definitely the level of balance is completely different for each right. client isn't it right yeah and um, so I recently moved into a flat of my own and um, just at Christmas time and I don't have a clue where to start with decorating it. I probably should have started a bit quicker than this. <laughs> but what tips would you give someone who's just starting their interior design journey? Um, I mean, nowadays it's Pinterest, but it used to be like, like, like people would like, I would, I'd come to so many clients go to their house and they'd had like that little manila folder full of pages that they torn out a magazine, which yeah. is basically a very old school format. Uh -huh. Fascinating, if you look at all of those pictures, to see, and you will see this when you do that, there is a thing that you like, there is a thing that you respond to. Mm -hmm. it, it may not be clearly evident from one picture of something you like, but 40 pictures on a Pinterest page of your dream bedroom there will be repeating motifs in every one of those pictures. It's, it's a, it's a canopy bed. It's, it's very minimal artwork. I mean, it could be, it could be any number of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the best place to start, to start piling ideas that you like, and then seeing what those kind of common threads might be across, across you know, all of the images. Yeah. 
cheapest thing you can ever do is put paint on the walls. Uh -huh. It's a two day project, a lot of bang for not a lot of buck. Uh -huh. um, it's a good place to start, and it makes you now make sure it's okay with your landlord. Um, or don't tell them and paint it back white when you're done. Um, and then just start searching. Um, always find the system design advice that I'll give you for free. A small room with a lot of small furniture looks very small. Uh -huh. Nothing small. But a small room with a couple of big pieces of furniture looks very small. So don't fall into the trap of thinking because you're in a rental space, you have little tiny furniture that you can move around. Like, like get get the biggest sofa you can get. Yeah. A, a, that you can afford you to get into the apartment. Measure all the doorways, make sure everything fits. Um, but a couple, a couple big pieces will have a huge impact mm -hmm. on what compared to a lot of little bitty yeah. tiny. Yeah. Well, that's a good tip. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> Free advice, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. And finally, this might be a bit of a tricky question for a tartan lover like yourself. But what is your favorite tartan? <laughs> okay, like I said, I like strangely colored tartans. Um, I mean, I love, I mean, I love black watch. I love Gone, my family tartan. Uh -huh. um, um, there's a tartan called Anderson. Yeah. That has a weird kind of like, like, or is he? That's a real favorite of mine. Uh -huh. um, because it's just so it's like it's like turquoise and yellow. Maybe the orange. It's it's just bizarre. Yeah. Um, so I yeah I like the more if, and it's still it's still traditional. Is the Anderson tartan? It is the traditional yeah. family. Um. Oh God, what was that one? I can see it in my files. Like I know where it is, know where it is when I sample on it. Oh, I'm having. Yeah. Just, uh, no, but I'll say, tartan is lovely, yeah. I'll say Anderson. Yeah. No, that's a lovely tartan, and it's so traditional, but, like, really, I, I feel like it feels quite modern just because it has, like, such bright colors in it. Right. I mean, I always wonder, I mean, so many of the tartans evolved from whatever kind of local vegetation was to that clan, and that's how they would dye threads to make Like, where the hell do the Andersons live? <laughs> Like what were they? What were they mushing up to make dye out of these amazing colors? I know. <laughs> I know they had a great tartan for you know all the tartans at that kind of time hundreds of years ago. They were all quite like darker and not as vibrant, but they they do have such a vibrant tartan. I know it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for joining me today and sharing your design tips and stories. I've loved speaking to you. It's been so interesting. And um, I wish you a safe next few months, and we look forward to keeping up with your future tartan designs. Perfect. Yeah, follow me on Instagram. There, they go up there. Yeah, so we'll make sure to do that. Keep up with you on there. You're always sharing such exciting things on your Instagram. Oh, thank you. Well, stay dry, stay warm. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love it.